Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, many of you have asked me to talk a little about the Kepler spacecraft and its mission to discover exoplanets. Now, obviously, it has been in the news recently because they announced another discovery. Uh, I mean, this thing has discovered thousands of exoplanets, but I actually want to go back to the spacecraft and talk a little about the history and how it works before we actually talk about the exoplanets. Hopefully this will be a one-part video, but you never know, I might get a little long-winded. Anyway, so the original spacecraft was a NASA spacecraft. It was built and launched in 2009. And from there, it basically proceeded to interplanetary space. It uh, is essentially in an Earth-trailing orbit, which means it's in an orbit slightly behind the Earth, which is actually going slightly slower, so it's dragging out behind us. The reason you put this in an Earth-trailing orbit is because they wanted to point the spacecraft at a single point in the sky and not have to worry about this giant planet that they're orbiting getting in the way. So yeah, they put it, put it out there in deep space with all the ability to fend for itself. And from there, it proceeded to observe a part of the sky, which was about, I think, 11 to 12 degrees across. So for example, if you take a look at the moon, that's about half a degree across. So imagine that about 20 times larger in the sky and you get an idea of how much of the sky is covered by this spacecraft. Now, it's a 1.4 meter mirror, which isn't that big as telescopes go, but it is the biggest telescope that was launched into interplanetary space, or at least it was at the time that it made it there. Now, the original plan was to have it observe for a few years. It would basically, as I said, point at a single part in the sky. But in that part of the sky, it's observing over 100,000 stars. And these are main sequence stars. They don't bother with the uh, red giants and things like that. They're actually looking for the compact main sequence stars because those are better to observe transits. That's how this, how this thing works. It looks for transits, planets passing in front of the stellar disk. Now, in many cases, most of those stars, the planets, if they are there, will not be passing across the plane of the star because they'll have the planes not aligned. So what they're doing is they were looking at hundreds of thousands of objects in the hope that some of them would have planets that were lined up just right so that we would see their shadow passing in front of the disk. Now, this meant quite a uh, high degree of accuracy. If you figure it out, the Earth passing in front of the Sun at stellar distances, it would block uh, about 84 parts per million, right? So 84 parts per million is kind of the threshold to detect an Earth-sized planet passing in front of a main sequence G-type star. Um, so they aimed for about 20 parts per million. And in practice, they didn't quite get up to that level. The probe was a little troubled technically. They only got down to, I think it was about 30 parts per million. But, you know, that was good enough to obviously detect it. But with that level of precision, random noise would still potentially create these signals that could look like planets. So you would actually have to make multiple passes. And that's why the first planets that were announced were short period large gas giants orbiting the stars, uh, you know, because these would give the strongest signals and they would give repeatable signals on very short limits. So anyway, how do you observe over 100,000 stars with this uh, mirror? Well, this mirror obviously focuses down to a plane and the plane is actually curved. And on that plane, right, so they have to curve it because the curvature of the mirror, basically it's optics. Your focal plane is curved slightly and usually you use successions of mirrors to reduce the curve as much as possible till it reaches your flat plane. Um, in telescopes, you actually tend to try to minimize the number of surfaces because you're losing light at each level. But I, I have cameras like digital uh, SLRs that have like seven or eight or nine elements inside their lenses to try and make the field as flat as possible. But if you're building a large flat field, there's another way you can do it. You can actually curve the field to start with, and that's what they did. And on this a, this focal plane, they placed 42 CCDs set up in pairs so that they had a, a pretty decent coverage, although there are gaps between the CCDs. Each of these CCDs has 2.2 megapixels. So you multiply it out, it's about 95 megapixels, which is pretty darn good. And it was, I think it was the most megapixels on a camera flown into deep space. Anyway, 
This whole thing would have to be kept very, very stable and each star would fall onto one, perhaps more pixels, depending on uh, how well focused it was. And they found that you didn't focus it precisely, you would actually get better results. So each pixel would be read out every six seconds and then internally they would accumulate the values on the pixels and eventually they would transmit the data back to Earth with uh, several hour integrations for the faint ones and... For the brighter ones, they would have much more frequent uh, uh, data readouts. So they pointed this out of the plane of the ecliptic towards uh, a region of the skies roughly near Cygnus, Lyra, Draco. It kind of got a bunch of different constellations up there. Well out of the ecliptic, the idea being that it wouldn't have much chance of asteroids or planets or whatever passing in front of us. And also... They pointed it in roughly the same direction, uh, sorry, roughly perpendicular to the galactic core, essentially facing backwards along the sun's orbit around the galaxy. The idea being that stars at roughly the same distance from the galactic core would probably have, or well, perhaps uh, would have roughly the same chance of having planets as the Earth. If there was any galactic distance uh, function in there. They wanted to try and minimize it. That was hypothesized, hasn't been proved one way or another. Anyway, they would hold this thing incredibly steady and they would collect all these numbers. And when they saw shadows, that would be a potential planetary candidate. And they would then go out and try to figure out if they saw other instances of it. Or sometimes they could uh, get more information from Earth-based observatories because they knew where to look. Anyway, Mission was going well, and then in 2012, July 14th, 2012, apparently, same you know anniversary of the whole Pluto thing, uh, one of its gyros failed. Now, the spacecraft has four, no, sorry, gyros, reaction wheels. Reaction wheels, as you know, you turn a reaction wheel one way, the spacecraft will turn the other way, so you can use this to steer the spacecraft. And they're very precise. They're used for pointing telescopes and stuff. And you had to keep this thing pointed very, very accurately, continuously, so you could get good data. It had four reaction wheels, so one failing is fine because you still have three others. You have three axes of rotation, three reaction wheels. You can keep control of them. But almost a year later, in 2013, a third rea a second reaction wheel let failed, leaving only two, which means you could control on two axes, but not on the third one. This was a big problem and essentially was going to spell the end of the main mission. They did ask for people to come up with ideas for how the mission could be continued. And of course, scientists and rocket scientists being the smart people that they are, they actually came up with a genius of a solution. Someone figured out that the spacecraft design was actually self-stabilizing based on solar radiation. The solar light bouncing off the satellite in the right orientation would balance it. It'd rather like a pendulum. Right, the pendulum at the bottom would remain exactly balanced. If you knocked it slightly, it would swing back and forth. So if you could get it into this orientation, then it would be stabilized in the roll axis. So what they did was they put the spacecraft uh, and rolled it so that it was pointing perpendicular to the sun, right? So if it was going around the sun like this, they would point it that way. And the sunlight would actually keep the thing stabilized. In the other two axes, they could use the two reaction wheels, and so they could keep it accurately enough to point in one direction, assuming that they wanted to point it uh, this way to the sun. And that's fine. They could do that for a few months, and then what would happen is they would start to worry. So they would be going around the sun, and eventually they would start to get close to the sun. So what do they do is they rotate the spacecraft 90 degrees. Obviously, don't rotate it that way. They rotate it that way. They wouldn't want to point it at the sun. Assuming my head is the sun, you know, obviously. I mean, I know it reflects a little bit. Uh, yeah, regardless. So they do three months pointing at one direction and then three months pointing the other direction. And they can switch back and forth every three months and get decent field data. So they have restarted the mission and they are collecting new data. This new discovery is still from the first part of the mission, but the K2, as they call it, Kepler-2, has actually discovered planets. Uh, in fact, it was in a test data set they discovered a planet early on. So while it hasn't produced the thousands of candidates and confirmed objects 
we've still seen about 20 candidates from the K2 mission. And as data gets continued to be analyzed, we're sure to see more things from the Kepler mission. Anyway, I'm Scott Manley, on to part two.